As the designated guardian and interpreter of the Constitution, the Supreme Court of the United States wields immense power. Whether it's a ruling on segregated schools, the rights of an individual upon arrest, the legitimacy of an election recount, or, most notably these days, abortion, court rulings routinely affect the everyday lives of American citizens, arguably as much as the laws made on Capitol Hill. It wasn't always that way. In the Federalist No. 78, written prior to the ratification of the Constitution, Alexander Hamilton described the judiciary as the least dangerous branch of the government. Five years later, future President James Madison argued in an open letter that the executive and legislative branches held a concurrent right to expound the Constitution. So how did we get the court we have today? Enter the landmark case of all landmark cases. It's Marbury vs. Madison on this episode of Bigfoot's Great American History Show. In the years prior to American independence, most colonial judges served at the will of the king. This stood in contrast to their counterparts in England, who had won the right of tenure following the Glorious Revolution. Accordingly, many colonists associated the judiciary with tyranny and the much-despised crown. Moreover, colonial judges held a certain amount of discretionary authority to interpret English common law, an unwritten set of rules based on precedent and so-called fundamental principles. After 1776, the more radical of the Founding Fathers sought to put these precedents of common law on paper as codified statutes. As Thomas Jefferson put it, the judiciary would then serve as a mere machine, with eyes that saw in blacks and whites rather than in greys. Let the state legislatures make sufficient laws, they reasoned, and the judges would have less latitude to abuse their power. By 1787, many Founding Fathers had lost confidence in these once idealized state legislatures. Laws proliferated, too many of them in their eyes, often confusing and contradictory, and thus, ironically, requiring judges to interpret them. Moreover, the rights of the minority were often left unprotected by these popularly elected lawmakers. This abuse by state legislatures ultimately led even staunch supporters of states' rights, like James Madison, to push for a new federal constitution. Thus, those fundamental principles implied in common law were set down in a new U.S. Constitution. Yet even after it was ratified in 1789, many questions remained. There were bound to be future disagreements about what that sacred document meant. Who would settle those disagreements? The Constitution itself didn't say. The new Constitution provided for the creation of a Supreme Court, but it offered no further guidelines for the organization of federal courts beneath it. It fell to the first Congress then to write the Judiciary Act of 1789, which established a three-tiered federal system including district and circuit courts. Section 13 of the Act also granted the Supreme Court the power to order writs of mandamus, and pay attention here, this will be on the quiz. These writs gave the court the power to issue orders to government officials if said government officials failed to fulfill their legally defined obligations. In 1801, following a sweeping Republican victory in the presidential and congressional elections, the lame duck Federalists pushed through a new Judiciary Act, increasing the number of circuit courts and stuffing them with an additional 18 Federalist judges. The number of seats on the Supreme Court would be reduced by one upon the next vacancy, thus preventing an appointment by the incoming Republican president, Thomas Jefferson. Rest assured, these appoint and delay tactics were definitely never used again in the history of American politics. The very next year, the 1801 Act would be repealed by the new Republican legislature. By then, however, outgoing President John Adams had appointed a new Chief Justice, one who would alter the trajectory of the Supreme Court and indeed of American history forever. John Marshall was a loyal Federalist who had pushed for ratification of the Constitution at the Virginia Ratifying Convention. By the turn of the century, his celebrity was on the rise after his role in rejecting a French demand for a bribe came to light in the so-called XYZ affair. By all accounts, he was a charming man blessed with a keen intellect. Thomas Jefferson had this to say of him. When conversing with Marshall, I never admit anything. You must never give him an affirmative answer, or you will be forced to grant his conclusion. Why, if he were to ask me if it were daylight or not, I'd reply, Sir, I don't know. I can't tell. 
At the time of Marshall's appointment, judges were still largely considered political figures, as it was many served simultaneously in other governmental roles. The Supreme Court itself had in many ways become a political weapon of the Federalist Party. Justice William Patterson, for example, flatly instructed the jury in the Whiskey Rebellion trials to find the defendants guilty. Justice Samuel Chase openly campaigned for John Adams in 1800. Prudently, Marshall foresaw that if the public was to ever accept the Supreme Court's role as the sole interpreter of the Constitution, judges would have to shed their Federalist clothing. Indeed, he literally dumped the magisterial scarlet robes the justices wore at the time for robes of plain black. He also took pains to avoid conflict with Republicans and refused to declare the 1802 judiciary repeal unconstitutional, as many Federalists were calling for him to do. Marshall knew he needed a less confrontational case to assert the court's right to determine constitutionality. He would soon find it. William Marbury was among the so-called midnight judges appointed by Adams in 1801. The outgoing Secretary of State at the time, ironically, John Marshall himself, failed to deliver Marbury's commission as a Justice of the Peace for the District of Columbia before leaving office. The incoming Secretary of State, the aforementioned Republican James Madison, refused to deliver it at all. Marbury thus sought a writ of mandamus from the Supreme Court in order to receive his commission. The Supreme Court might easily have ruled in Marbury's favor and issued the writ, yet if it did so and the Jefferson administration refused to follow the order, the court would just look silly and the precedent established would likely diminish the court's power in future cases. At the same time, Marshall was equally unwilling to acknowledge that Jefferson and Madison could simply ignore their responsibilities. The solution Marshall devised was ingenious. In a unanimous decision, the court ruled that Marbury was indeed entitled to his commission, yet it could not issue a writ of mandamus because Section 13 of the 1789 Judiciary Act altered the scope of the Supreme Court beyond what was allowed by the Constitution. Yet by voiding Section 13 and seemingly curtailing its own power, the Marshall Court established the precedent of judicial review, the right of the court to declare laws unconstitutional. And so, ironically, gave itself an immense new power in return. Lose the battle, win the war. William Marbury never received his commission, yet in the decades following Marbury versus Madison, the Supreme Court would on several occasions void state laws when they were deemed to be in conflict with the federal constitution. Judges would come to be seen less and less as political agents and more and more as nonpartisan legal experts. This, of course, required the training of legal experts. Obligingly, Harvard Law School was established in 1817 and Yale Law School in 1824. And this is why Supreme Court justices look like they're watching a funeral at the State of the Union address. Let us know your thoughts on the Marshall Court's legacy in the comments below. Was it positive, negative, a little of both? And if you enjoyed this content, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Until next time, this is Bigfoot saying so long, and save me a seat at your next campfire. Mm -hmm.